Today's scripture is taken from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star is rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. These are the words of the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. You know, every time I hear scripture, it's often something different pops out. And there was, as I was listening to Bruce read that text so well, um, isn't it amazing when people who don't have good intentions in the ways of God actually give us good advice? Herod who sought to kill Jesus, actually gave good advice. He said, go and seek diligently for him. Would it be that we each would seek diligently for our Lord Jesus? So that's not my sermon. That was just extra. That was, for, that was for free this morning. Let's pray. Almighty and gracious God, we ask that you would help us hear this familiar text in new ways that we would hear exactly what you have for us in it today. That you would instruct us and change us, inspire us, correct us, affirm us, encourage us. Lord, do all that you desire and will do by your spirit to your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Matthew um, begins his gospel a chapter earlier than the text we read today. He begins his gospel in the most Jewish of ways. If you are um, a student of scripture, or even if you have a a glancing familiarity, you might recall that Matthew begins his gospel with genealogy. This person begat this person, who begat this person, and it's a long genealogy. And when most people get about five to seven names into it, they just skip. They go, okay, when does this end? And then they go to the, the next part, when the angel appeared to Joseph and told him that he should go ahead and, and marry Mary. But there was a a reason and a purpose for Matthew to begin his gospel with the genealogy. You see, Matthew, in many ways, is the most Jewish of all the gospels. And it, uh, it applies back and it references Jewish prophecies more than the other Gospels do. It seems as though Matthew had a, a particular audience in mind, a particularly Jewish audience in mind, when he wrote his Gospel. He makes it clear that Jesus is the descendant of Abraham. And so Jesus is the one who fulfills the Abrahamic covenant, the one made to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. He makes it clear that Jesus is the descendant of David. And so he fulfills the Davidic covenant, that of David's family and of his reign, there would be no end. 
that Jesus answers and Jesus um, fulfills all of these ancient prophecies. And by Matthew tying Jesus' genealogy to both Abraham and David, he does it. And then unlike Luke, there is no telling of the story by angels. The shepherds aren't mentioned in Matthew's gospel. In fact, um, shortly after the dialogue between the angel and Joseph, Matthew skips ahead. He, he misses the, the whole trip to um, Bethlehem and that first Christmas day and, and evening. And Matthew goes into details then about the magi, these kings from the east who come to visit Jesus. And there are at least five truths that the Holy Spirit, through Matthew, wants us to see, I believe, in this story this morning. And particularly, things that God desires us to see about worship. First, Jesus is the Messiah, the King of the Jews, and should be worshipped and honored as such. Secondly, Jesus is to be worshipped not just by Jews, but by all the nations of the world, as representative, represented by the wise men who come from the East. Three, God wields the universe to make his Son known and worshipped. Four, Jesus is troubling to people who do not want to worship him, and often those who worship him receive opposition. For doing so. And five, worshiping Jesus means joyfully ascribing authority and dignity to Christ with special and sacrificial gifts. First, Jesus is the Messiah, the King of the Jews, and Jesus should be honored as such. Verse 2 announces clearly whom this story is really about. The kings go to Herod and say, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Matthew first declares this in his gospel by tracing, as I said, the lineage back to King David. Jesus is the descendant of King David, the king of Israel, of whom it was promised his kingdom would have no end. It's about a newborn child destined to be king of the Jews. Now, in and of itself, that wouldn't be that particularly interesting. Lots of would-be and future kings would be born and nobody came to visit them at all. In fact, there are probably four or five future presidents of the United States living in the United States right now. We don't know who they are. Nobody showed up to, to, worship, to worship them as future presidents. Nobody started lobbying their families at their birth that they would receive special favor. None of that took place, but they're here. Just as in, in, in all times, kings come and go and are born, and nobody gives really much attention. But for some reason, these kings were called by God to worship this king at his birth at his appearing. Verse 4 makes clear why the Magi really meant and what they meant by king of the Jews. It says, gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, Herod inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. Herod had been called king of the Jews. Herod was given that designation by the, the Roman Senate that sat in Rome. They appointed and they named Herod king of Palestine and king of the Jews. And he had reigned for almost 40 years. But no one called him Messiah. Messiah means the long-awaited, God-appointed, God-anointed ruler who would overcome all other rule and bring in the end of history itself and establish the kingdom of God and that this king would never die and would never lose his reign, that he would reign as the great um, chorus sings in, in Handel's Messiah, he shall reign forever and ever, alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. The wise men who had been influenced by 
the dispersion of the Jews into Babylon generations, centuries earlier. These Jews, as they were dispersed to Babylon, brought with them their expectation of a Messiah. And Daniel and others told the people with whom they were living that that's what they were looking for, that's what they were expecting. And so there was in the the Babylonian culture a knowledge and an understanding that the Jews had this expectation that this great Messiah, the Messiah of the Jews and the Messiah of the world would appear. And so when this unique celestial event occurred and appointed them to, to, to Israel, these magi went looking. You see, God had used um, hundreds of years earlier the fact that Jews had been dispersed there to prepare the way for them to have this epiphany, this aha moment. Maybe the one they've been talking about has appeared. Maybe this one has arrived. Jesus, the Messiah, has come. You see, you never know, as you plant seeds in the life of another person, how it is that God is going to use them. As you share your faith in Jesus, as you love someone sacrificially, as you offer grace and mercy to another, we never know how it is God is going to use that. No one would have ever thought that 400 years earlier, God would get Jewish people in Babylon so that these three kings would know that the Jews had an expectation of a Messiah. So that when he came, they would say, this must be it. And they would come to worship. You see, just as the Jewish people were called to remain faithful in their exile, we are called to remain faithful in our lives, in our witness, in our devotion to Lord Jesus. So Herod calls together the religious leaders and asks the scribes, And the one text that these scribes focus on is Micah, chapter 5, verses 2 and verse 6. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Now that doesn't sound very extraordinary either. The reason is that the only purpose for which the scribes quoted the text was to answer the question, where? You see, Herod wanted to know where this one had been born. But I wonder what they would have quoted if Herod had asked them who it was that had been born. They might have read on into Micah 5 verse 2. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. That's who was born. Or verse 4, and he will arise and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will remain because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. So this king is not just coming in to being in the womb of his mother Mary. His going forth are from where? From long ago, from eternity. That's who was born. Not just where, but who. Or as John's gospel said, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Emmanuel, God with us. The birth of the Messiah means the eternal one has been born. The one who is beyond time, the one who is before the beginning and will exist into eternity, is the one who has entered into our space and our time. And this king would not be limited to the realm of Israel. He will be great. Where does Micah say? To the ends of the earth. That's the first truth, and this is why we worship is on our mind. And it leads us to the second truth in this text about the Messiah. Jesus is to be worshipped not just by the Jews, but by all the nations of the world, as represented from the wise men from the East. You know, isn't it It's fascinating to me to think about the fact that um, we as Gentiles, we, we had representatives 
at the birth of Jesus. The wise men were there to represent us. You see, God brought everybody to come and worship Jesus. The heavenly hosts worshiped Jesus in the angelic chorus. The Jewish people through shepherds and Anna and Simeon and Elizabeth and Joseph and Mary all worshiped Jesus. The, the heavens themselves worshiped Jesus and that the stars were rearranged to pay homage and worship to Jesus and the Gentiles worshiped Jesus as the Magi came and bent the knee before the Messiah, the Eternal One, long promised. Notice that Matthew does not tell us about the shepherds coming to visit Jesus in the stable. His focus is immediately on foreigners coming from the east to worship Jesus. Verse 1, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, the king, magi from the east, arrived in Jerusalem saying, Where is he that has been born king of the Jews? So Matthew declares Jesus at the beginning is the Messiah, not just of the Jew, but also of the Gentile. He is the Savior of the nations. And so from the very beginning of, of Matthew's Gospel, this man who wrote um, this very Jewish book made it clear that Gentiles also were to come. It's interesting to note also that's how Matthew ends his Gospel. In the 28th chapter of Matthew, Jesus says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Go therefore and baptize what all the nations, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you, and I am with you to the end of the age. You see, Matthew in this most Jewish of all the Gospels is very clear that there are bookends at the very beginning, at the very end of his Gospel. He makes it clear this is also the Gospel for the Gentiles. And we're welcome to the party. And we are invited to come and worship and pay homage. This not only opened the door for us Gentiles to rejoice in the Messiah, it added proof that he was the Messiah. Because of the repeated prophecies that was that the nations and kings would in fact come to him as ruler of the world. For example, Isaiah chapter 60 verse 3 would prophesy, Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. So Matthew adds proof to the messiahship of Jesus and shows that he is a messiah, a king, a promise fulfiller for all the nations, not just for Israel, not just the Jews. Three, God wields the universe to make his Son known and worshipped. This is God's great goal of all things, that his Son be known and worshipped. These verses could be theme verses for our church's mission statement, to know Jesus and make him known. Over and over, the Bible baffles our curiosity about just how certain things happen. We read the scriptures and we wonder, how did God do that? How did God divide the Red Sea? How did the manna show up every morning? How did the, the prophet Elijah make, a, make an altar which had been drenched in water be consumed in fire? How did God do these things? And, and sometimes we as Christians are, are tempted to go down these rabbit trails, aren't we? Into figuring it out. Well, this could have happened this way. The wind could have blown that way. That's what this really was. And, and sometimes we as Christians get distracted from the main point by one of these side points. Have you ever known um, that kind of Christian who is constantly sending you articles or wanting you to read this or wanting you to listen to that about some minor obscure point that they've almost become obsessed about? Well, I can guarantee you, you all do it because you send them to me all the time. <laughs> And it's interesting, and, and it is important to say that, yes, the Bible is true, and we, we should have a desire to, to understand how these things align. But, friends, never get so down those rabbit trails of the how God did things that we miss the why God did things. You see, because all of those things happened for reasons. The sea was part of the man that came. The star shone for a reason. And what was that reason? 
to declare Christ and have him worshipped. The, car, the, the star came as a sign. The star came to bring the Magi to that place. The star shone so that creation would do what creation had been created to do. And what has creation been created to do? The psalmist tells us the heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens declare, in this case, the birth of Lord Jesus and calls us, just as the heavens were called, to worship this Christ. There are a couple things, as I said, that the, the star is doing. The first thing that the star is doing is declaring the the glory of God. The second thing the star is doing is something that it cannot do on its own. It is guiding the Magi to the Son of God to worship him. There is only one person in biblical thinking that can be behind that kind of intentionality of the stars. There is only one who could arrange that, and it's God. God was calling the Magi to that place so that the Gentiles would have a representative. Just think about all the things that God was putting in motion. God put it in the mind of Caesar to call a census so that Mary would be taken from Nazareth to Bethlehem so that the prophecy would be fulfilled. And at the same time that's happening, God is rearranging the stars in heaven so that people who had been influenced by Jewish um, exiles hundreds of years earlier would see the star and know something spectacular was happening. No, this just wasn't some kind of happenstance. This just isn't an event that happened to take place and some people wrote it down and took some notes about it. It was finally meticulously orchestrated by the King of Heaven. God himself was putting all of these things into motion so that what would happen? Worship would take place so that Christ would be worshipped. So glorious of an event is the worship of Jesus that God would literally change heaven and earth to make sure that the worship of his son was accomplished. This is God's design. He did it then he is still doing it now. His aim is that the nations, all the nations, would come to worship his son, Emmanuel, God with us. It's stated clearly in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. And this good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the world as a testimony to all the nations and that the end will come. This is God's will for everybody in your family. This is God's will for those with whom you have contact in your neighborhood, in your circle of friends and influence, in your places of work, in your school. Indeed, this is God's desire for every family, for every tribe, every nation on earth. As John 4, 23 says, such the Father seeks to worship him. And the Father still is seeking us out calling us to worship in spirit and in truth. At the beginning of Matthew, we have a come and see dynamic. But at the end of Matthew, we have a go and tell. There's a come and see, go and tell. Just as the shepherds were called to go and see, and then they went and told. Just as Matthew begins, come and see, Matthew ends, go and tell. And the same is for us. We are to come and to worship Christ that we would know Christ. That we would have an intimate, personal relationship with him. That we would understand his, his salvation and his glory and his grandeur. And then we're to go and tell. We're to go and tell of his glory. And then fourth, Jesus is troubling to people who do not worship him. And he brings out opposition 
for those who do worship him. This is probably not a main point in the mind of Matthew, but it's inescapable as the story goes on. In this story, there are two kinds of people who do not worship Jesus as the Messiah. The first kind is the people who simply do nothing about Jesus. They're even called into the story, but they have a ho-hum attitude about the coming of the Messiah. They're not intrigued by it. They're not um, enhanced by it. They're not called to it. They don't look into it more deeply. They just kind of let the knowledge come and let it go. This group is represented by the chief priests and the scribes. Verse 4 says that Herod, gathering together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, Herod inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. Well, they told him, and that was it. Back to business as usual for the Pharisees and the scribes. The sheer silence and inactivity of the leaders is deafening in view of the magnitude of what was happening generation after generation after generation after generation after generation and I could keep going until you're tired of me saying generation had waited for this Messiah and they were just asked about it they didn't seem to care they seemed to be rather indifferent and notice verse 3 says when Herod the king heard this he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. In other words, the rumor was going around that someone thought the Messiah was born. The inactivity on the part of the chief priests is staggering. Why didn't they go with the Magi? Why didn't they ask if they could take along? Why didn't they research it any further? They do not want to worship the true God. We have folks in our life, don't we? that we've shared and we've shared and we've, we've invited, and there just seems to be no movement in them towards Jesus. They also are represented in the Christmas story. The second kind of people who do not want to worship Jesus is the kind who feel deeply threatened by his coming. That is Herod in this story. He is really afraid so much so that he schemes and lies and will ultimately commit mass murder in an attempt to snuff out the Messiah. So today, these two kinds of opposition will come against Christ and his worshipers and his church. There will be indifference and there will be hostility. Regardless of what role Jesus has played in your life and thinking up till now, let this Christmas season, this year, be the time when you reconsider the Messiah and ponder what it means to worship him. If you've ever been indifferent, let the indifference melt away. Catch the joy and the excitement of what God has done in Jesus Christ and his coming at Christmas. Fifth. Worshiping Jesus means joyfully ascribing authority and dignity to Christ with sacrificial gifts. Piper points out there are four pieces to that definition of worship, and all four are grounded in this text. First, we see Magi ascribing authority to Jesus Christ by calling him King of the Jews. Verse 2, where is he that was born King of the Jews? Second, we see the Magi ascribing dignity to Christ by falling down before him. In verse 11 we read, After coming into the house, they saw the Christ with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Falling to the ground is what you do to say to someone else, You are high and I am low. You have great dignity and I am lowly in comparison. Third, we see the joy that the Magi ascribed. These descriptions of authority and dignity are found in verse 10. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Now this is a quadruple way of saying 
they rejoiced. What Matthew is saying is they rejoiced, they rejoiced, they rejoiced, they rejoiced. It would have been much to say they rejoiced. It would have been more if Matthew had written they rejoiced with joy. It would have been even more if Matthew had written they rejoiced with great joy. But what did Matthew say? They rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Do you get the point? Matthew says, they worshipped in joy. We should worship in joy. We should worship in joy over the fact that the Messiah has come. The Redeemer has come. He has come into this world to save and rescue sinners like you and me. He yearns for us and for our salvation. He is for us. They were so in love and they were so inspired that they ascribed to him joy overwhelmingly and exceedingly. Would it be that those of us who know so much about Jesus would have great and exceeding joy even as these who knew so little about him and yet rejoiced? And the fourth part of the definition of worship here is that we do our ascribing as the kings did with sacrificial gifts. Before I hit the meat of this point, I want to say there are indeed prophetic and important aspects to the specific gifts that were given by the kings to Jesus, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These gifts are important on several levels. One level is, is that they fulfill prophecies about the kinds of gifts that would be given to the Messiah. These specific gifts are mentioned in Isaiah, that they would be given. So it fulfills the prophecy. It also declares what the ministry of Jesus will entail. It foreshadows his crucifixion on the cross and his entombment in the grave with embalming spices that were given. These three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, also point to what has been often called as the threefold office of Christ. He is prophet, he is priest, and he is king. And gold, frankincense, and myrrh represent those three offices. The, the prophet and the priest and the king each independently had an identity with those three items. And so when the, the Magi brought these items, they were probably unknowingly communicating loudly the ministry and the person that Jesus would become. But the main point is, that worshiping Jesus means joyfully ascribing authority and dignity to Christ with sacrificial gifts. This is the same idea we unpacked last year when we were going through Acts verse by verse, and when we got to Acts chapter 17, verse 25, we looked at what it means to give sacrificially. So the gifts of the Magi are not given by way of assistance or need meeting. They didn't give these things to Jesus because he needed them. That Jesus was somehow deficient in these items and so he had to have them. He didn't give them because they were somehow on some Christmas wish list by Mary or Joseph. They gave them because they were sacrificial gifts. It would dishonor a monarch if foreign visitors came with some kind of royal care package. Nor are these gifts meant to be bribes. Deuteronomy 10, 17 says that God takes no bribes. They weren't trying to say, well, maybe we can gain favor with them if we give them some really expensive things. Well, then what do they mean? And how are these gifts worshipped? The gifts are intensifiers of desire for Christ himself in much the same way that fasting is. When you give a gift to Christ like this, it's a way of saying, the joy that I pursue, remember exceeding with great joy, 
is not the hope of getting rich with things from you. I have not come to you for your things, but I have come to you to worship you, to sacrificially give you things that represent the sacrificial and the desire of my heart and the joy of my heart. I worship you, O God, sacrificially. I give something of myself, something precious, something meaningful. By giving to you what you do not need and what I might enjoy, I ascribe to you, O God, worship. When we give to God sacrificially, we are saying more earnestly and more authentically, you are my treasure. You know, so often we can take the treasures of this world, God's love, the Lord Jesus Christ, the majesty of God, and we turn them into trinkets. And we flip it on its head, and often we take the trinkets of this world and turn them into treasures, and we value them more than the things that are really treasures. This is what Jesus was getting at when he said, Seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. And all these other things, these trinkets, will be added unto you. But seek first the important things. And that's what we do in worship. We seek first the glory of God, the majesty of God, the dignity of God. And we do it with joy and sacrifice. And why do we bring sacrificially to this one? Because he is worthy. He is worthy of our joy. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our adoration. He and he alone is worthy. If God would orchestrate the stars to declare his glory, if God would orchestrate the angelic chorus to praise his glory, if God would orchestrate the, the, the secular emperors to get people in the right places to praise his glory. If God would bring shepherds and Anna and Simeon and Elizabeth and Mary and Joseph, if God would have it announced to the priests and the scribes to declare his glory, if God would bring magi from the east to declare his glory, what do you think he wants from us? He wants us to worship him and to declare his glory. Friends, this story of the kings, this magi, are not just a, a little add-on to the Christmas story, but they reveal to us the heart of what's really happening. The Messiah has come. The King of kings and Lord of lords, the one who will reign forever and ever. The King of kings and Lord of lords, the King of kings and Lord of lords, forever and ever. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Let us adore him. Christ the Lord. I do pray that God awakens within each of us joyful worship through this text. That we are compelled to worship him in ways and in depth that we never have before. And that we would rejoice. The Messiah has come. And he will come again. Come Lord Jesus. In the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you pray with me? Almighty and gracious God, we do pray that you would awaken in your people, you would awaken in your church, you would awaken in each one of us a desire for worship that cannot be quenched, that cannot be silenced. Worship that takes place in the depth and silent meditations. Worship that takes place in our hearts. Worship that takes place in our actions. Worship that takes place in our singing. Worship that takes place in our prayers. Worship that takes place in our care for one another. Worship that takes place in our care for all of those you've given us to love and to tend to. Worship that takes place as we sacrificially give to you. Oh Lord, worship that takes place as we give to you our heart and ourselves and our being. 
O Lord, you call for us to give to you that which is most precious. And so we give our identity to you today. We give ourselves to you today. Even as we pray the words that was written by the apostle, I know not I, but Christ in me. Lord, we give you our heart. We give you our wills. Receive them, sanctify them, bless them, and use them for the filling of your creation with your glory. Lord, we lift up to you those who need a special measure of your care, those who are sick, those who are downtrodden, those who are depressed, those who are hurting, those who are broken, those who need restoration and reconciliation. Be their joy, O Lord. We pray for our nation. We seem to be at, at critical places and at impasse as a people, O oh Lord. We pray for our nation. We pray for our leaders that they would have wisdom. We pray for those who lead us and those who will lead us. 